As It Was by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa, read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful BC. Chapter 3 The first faint light appeared over the jagged eastern horizon. Great mountain ranges stood up in the starkest black, and behind them the sky was becoming luminous. On the topmost floor of the Lamasaries, monks and lamas stood ready to greet the new day. The topmost floor, the roof in each case, had a special platform or parapet on which great conches and trumpets, some fifteen to twenty feet long, stood on stands. The Valley of Lhasa was a pool of inky black. The moon had long since set, and the stars were diminished by the paling of the sky behind the eastern mountains. But the valley of Lhasa still slept, still lived in the deepest darkness of night. Not until the sun lifted well above the mountains would the deep-lying lamasaries and houses welcome daylight. Here and there, dotted randomly throughout the valley, infrequent pinpoints of light appeared as a llama or a cook or a herdsman had to prepare for a very early start to his work. The faint, faint gleams served merely to accentuate the velvet blackness, so black that not even the trunk of trees could be distinguished. The light beyond the eastern mountains increased. First there was a vivid flash of light, and then a red beam shot up, followed immediately by what appeared to be an absolutely green shaft of light, which was one of the features of the early morning sunrise and the late night sunset. Soon there came broader shafts of light, and within minutes there was a startling golden glow outlining the highest peaks, showing the ever-present snow reflecting off high glaciers and projecting down into the valley the first signs that the day had appeared. With the first appearance of the sun over the topmost edge of the mountains, the lamas blew hard into their trumpets, and others sounded into the conches, so that the very air seemed to shake with the sound. There was no immediate reaction to the noise, though, for the people of the valley were well used to the sound of trumpets and conches, and could ignore it, just as people in cities can ignore the roaring of aircraft, the clattering of garbage collections, and all the rest of the noises of civilization. Here and there, though, a sleepy night-bird uttered a startled chirp before putting his head beneath his wing again and going off to sleep. Now was the time of the creatures of the day. Gradually the day-birds came awake, cheeping sleepily and flapping their wings to get rid of the stillness. Here and there a feather drifted down and was blown at the whim of the vagrant breeze. In the waters of the Kai Chu and at the Snake Temple, fish were stirring lazily from their nighttime drifting near the surface. Fish in Tibet could always rise near the surface because Buddhists do not take life and there were no fishermen in Tibet. The old man, twisted at the sound of the bugles and the roaring of the conches, twisted and sleepily sat upright. From his low angle he peered upwards at the sky, and then a sudden thought struck him, and he rose creakily to his feet. His bones were aged, his muscles tired, so he rose with circumspection and made his way to a window and looked out across the now awakening city of Lhasa. Below him, in the village of Shou, 
little lights were beginning to appear, one after another, as butter lamps were being lit, so that officials who were going to be busy this day would have ample time for their preparations. The aged astrologer shivered in the early dawn chill, and pulled his robe more tightly around him. Inevitably, thoughts turned to the Lalu estate, which could not be seen from his vantage point, for he looked out over the village of Sho and the city of Lhasa, and the Lalu residence was at the other side of the Patala, facing the wall with the carved figures, which was so much an attraction for wandering pilgrims. The old man slowly lowered himself again to his blankets and rested while he thought of the events of the day. This day, he thought, would be one of the high points of his career, perhaps the culminating point of his career. Already the old man could feel the hand of death approaching him. He could feel the slowing down of his body processes. He could feel that already his silver cord was thinning. But he was glad that there was yet one more function he could perform and bring credit to the office of Chief Astrologer of Tibet. So thinking, he dozed off, to be awakened with something of a start as a llama bustled into the room, exclaiming, "'Honorable astrologer, the day is upon us. We have no time to lose. We have again to check the horoscope and the order in which the points are to be presented. I will assist you to rise, honorable astrologer.' So saying, he bent down and put an arm around the shoulders of the old man, and gently raised him to his feet. By now the light was increasing rapidly. The sun was clear of the eastern mountain range, and was reflecting light to the western side of the valley, while those houses and lamasseries right beneath the eastern range were yet in darkness. Those on the opposite side were in almost full daylight. The Putala was coming awake. There was the strange stir which humans always make when they are getting themselves into motion at the beginning of a day. There was a feeling of awareness that here were humans ready to continue this sometimes tedious business of living. Little silver bells were tinkling. Every so often there would come the lowing of a conch, or perhaps the brassy blare of a trumpet. The old astrologer and the others around him were not aware of the clanking and the turning of the prayer wheels. These were so much a part of their everyday existence that they had long since failed to perceive the noise the prayer wheels made just as no longer did they notice the prayer flags which whipped about in the morning breeze on the Patala heights above. Only a cessation of these noises would have been noticed by the startled people. There was the scurry of feet along corridors. There was the moving of heavy doors. From somewhere came the chanting of psalms, religious psalms, psalms again welcoming the new day. But the old astrologer had no time to notice things such as these, for now there was the business of coming to full awareness and to attending to those functions which are so necessary after a night of sleep. Soon he would be having his morning meal of sampa and tea, and then he would have to go and attend to the ritual of preparing for the reading which he was that day to give. At the Lalu family residence, the servants were awake. Lady Rampa, too, was awake, and Lord Rampa, after a hasty breakfast, gladly mounted his horse and rode off with his attendants to the offices of the government in the village of Sho. 
He was indeed glad to get away from his wife, get away from her bustling officiousness and her overzealous approach to the events facing them. He had to make an early start to his work, because later in the day it would be utterly incumbent upon him to return to play the part of the gracious host who was a prince of Lhasa. The heir to the Rampa estates was awakened and came to life most reluctantly. Today was his day. Yet, he thought with some confusion, how could it be his day when mother was planning to make such a social advantage from it? If he had his way, he would forget the idea and disappear to the banks of the river, so that he could watch the boatmen ferrying people across the river, and perhaps, when there were not too many people to be ferried, he could manage to con the ferryman into giving him free passage, backwards and forwards, always with the excuse, of course, that he would help pull the ferry. The poor wretched boy was most unhappy at the hard-hearted man-servant who was thoroughly smearing his tail with yak butter and then plating a tight pigtail with curious twists in it. The yak butter was kneaded into the pigtail until the latter was almost as still as a willow rod. At about ten in the morning there was the sound and clatter of horses, and a party of men rode in to the courtyard. The Lord Rampa and his attendants had returned from the government offices, because it was necessary that the family should go to the Cathedral of Lhasa to give thanks for whatever mysteries were to be revealed on this day and, of course, to show to priests ever ready to believe that black heads were irreligious, that these were specially religious black heads. In Tibet, monks have shaven heads, while the ordinary people, the laity, had long hair. Most times it was black hair, and because of that black hair, they were referred to as black heads. People were waiting in the courtyard. Lady Rampa, already upon a pony, and her daughter Yasodhara. At the last moment the heir of the family was grabbed and unceremoniously hoisted upon a pony that appeared equally reluctant. The gates were opened again, and the party rode out with the Lord Rampa at the head. For about thirty minutes they rode in strange silence, until at last they came to the small houses and the shops which surrounded the Cathedral of Lhasa, the cathedral which had stood there for so many hundreds of years to afford a place of worship for the pious. The original stone floors were deeply grooved and scored by the footsteps of pilgrims and sightseers. All along the entrance to the cathedral were lines of prayer wheels, big things indeed, and as each person went by they turned the wheel, as was the custom, so that a most curious tinkling clatter was set up which had an almost hypnotic effect. The inside of the cathedral was heavy, overpowering in its heaviness, with the scent of incense and the memory of incense, which had been burned during the past thirteen or fourteen hundred years. The heavy black beams of the roof seemed to have clouds of incense growing from them, bluish smoke, gray smoke, and occasionally a smoke of a brownish hue. There were various gods and goddesses represented in golden figures, wooden figures, and porcelain figures, and before each were the offerings of pilgrims. 
Every so often the offerings would be swept behind a metal net to protect them from pilgrims whose piety was overcome by the desire to participate in the wealth of the gods. Heavy candles burned and made flickering shadows throughout the dim building. It was a sobering thought even to a small boy not yet seven years of age to reflect that these candles had been kept alight by pouring on butter throughout thirteen or fourteen hundred years. The poor boy, gazing wide-eyed around him, thought, Let's get this day over, and perhaps I shall be able to go to some other country away from all this holiness. Little did he know what was in store for him. A big cat strolled lethargically forward and rubbed against the legs of the heir of the Rampa family. The boy stooped and dropped to his knees to fondle the big cat, who roared with delight. These were the guardian cats of the temple, astute students of human nature, who could tell at a glance those who would be likely to attempt to steal and those who could be trusted. Normally such cats would never, never approach anyone other than their own particular keeper. For a moment there was stunned silence among the onlookers, and some of the monks faltered in their chanting as their eyes wandered to the sight of the boy on his knees by the big cat. The picture was soon spoiled, however, because the Lord Rampa, his face suffused with rage, bent down and picked up the boy by the scruff of his neck, shook him like a housewife shaking out a duster, gave him a slap on the ear which made the boy think there was a thunderstorm, and then dumped him on his feet again. The cat turned towards his lordship, and uttered a very long, loud hiss, and then turned with dignity and strode away. But the time had come to return to the Lalu residence, for soon the guests would start arriving. Many of the guests came early, so that they could get the pick of what was offered, and the pick of what was offered included the best place in the garden. So the party left the confines of the cathedral and went out into the street again. The boy raised his eyes and saw the flags fluttering over the road which led to India, and he thought, Shall I soon be on that road, going to another count? I shall soon know, I suppose, but my goodness, I would like something to eat. The party rode on retracing their footsteps, and after twenty-five to thirty minutes they were again entering the courtyard of the house where they were greeted by an anxious steward who thought that there might have been some delay and that he would have to explain to irate guests that the host and hostess had been unaccountably delayed at the cathedral. There was time for a hurried meal, and then the heir to the estates rushed to the window at unexpected noises approaching up the road. Monk musicians were arriving. Their musical instruments were clattering as they rode along the road on their ponies. Every so often a monk would give an experimental blow to his trumpet or clarinet to make sure that it was in tune. Now and again, a monk would give a hearty bonk to a drum to make sure that the skin was at the correct tautness. Eventually, they entered the courtyard and went by the side path into the gardens, carefully depositing their instruments on the ground. The instruments deposited, they reached for the Tibetan beer gladly. The beer was there in some profusion to prepare them, to get them in the right mood, to make jovial music instead of somber classical stuff. 
but there was no time to deal with the musicians. The first of the guests were arriving. They came in a body. It seemed as if all Lassa was moving on to the Lalu residence. Here came a small army of men on horseback, all heavily armed. It was something like the invading army sent by the British, but this army was armed only because ceremony and protocol demanded it. They rode with men on the outside, and between the lines of men the women rode, where they were adequately protected from any imaginary attack. The armed servitors had their spears and pikes gaily decorated with flags and with pennants. Here and there, as the monk was in the party, prayer flags fluttered from a staff. In the courtyard itself there were two lines of servants, headed by the steward on one side and the chief household priest on the other. There was much ado with bowing and returning bows and bowing again as the guests were ushered in. Each guest was helped off his horse as if, as the heir to the household thought, they were all a lot of paralyzed dummies. Their horses were led away and given ample food, and then, depending upon the status of the guests, they were either shown into the garden and left to fend for themselves, or shown into the house, where they could exclaim over this or that article, articles which had been put out especially to impress the guests. Of course, in Tibet, scarves are given and received, and there was much confusion as the arriving guests presented scarves and then received scarves in return. Sometimes there was a most awkward incident when some bemused servant would unthinkingly hand back to the guest the scarf which he or she had just presented. There would be embarrassed smiles and muttered apologies, but soon the matter would be straightened out. Lady Rampa was red of face and perspiring freely. She was terrified that the old astrologer, the chief astrologer of all Tibet, must have died or fallen into the river or been trampled upon by a horse or some similar mishap because there was no sign of him and the whole purpose of the party was to have the reading of the future for the heir to the household without the chief astrologer that could not be done a servant was dispatched at the run to ascend to the highest point in the house and to look out towards the patala to see if there was any sign of the approaching cavalcade which would herald the impending arrival of the astrologer. The servant departed and soon was seen at the topmost roof. He was gesticulating with his arms and dancing a little jig in his excitement. Lady Rampa was furious, absolutely frustrated. She had no idea what the servant was trying to convey. It looked as if he was drunk more than anything else. So, hastily, she sent a fresh servant to get a report as to what was happening. Soon the two servants arrived together and explained that the astrological cavalcade was just crossing the plain of Ki Chu. That was the signal for increased fervor. Lady Rampa ushered everyone out of the house and into the garden, telling them to take their places because the great chief astrologer was arriving at any moment. The monk musicians straightened up and started to play, making the air shake and vibrate with the excitement that they put into the event. The Lalu estate gardens were large and very well kept. There were trees from all over Tibet, even some from India, from Bhutan and Sikkim. Bushes, too, 
grew in great profusion, with exotic blooms entrancing the eye, but now the wonderful showpiece of a garden was thronged with avid sightseers, people who had no thought for horticulture, people who were there for sensation. The great Lord Rampa wandered disconsolately about, chewing on his knuckles with an agony of anguished frustration, and at the same time trying to smile amiably at those people whom he felt he should beam upon. Lady Rampa was almost wearing herself shorter by the amount of running about that she was doing. She was in continuous bustle, trying to see the Lord Rampa wasn't too austere, trying to see what the heir to the estate was doing, what the servants were doing, and keeping a ready eye for the arrival of the chief astrologer. There came the sound of horses' steps. The steward hurried to the main gate, which was carefully shut behind him. He stood ready to order its opening at just the right moment to make the maximum effect. Guests had heard the horses and were now streaming from the garden into a very large room which, for the occasion, had been converted into a refectory reception room. Here they found buttered tea waiting for them, and, of course, delicacies from India, very sweet, sticky cakes, which would effectively glue them up and prevent them from talking so much. There came the sound of a deep-toned gong, its voice echoing and reverberating around the building a mighty gong some five feet high and which was only used on the most solemn occasions now a highly placed manservant was standing by it giving it the special strokes which he'd been practicing on a smaller gong for days past the gong boomed, the gate swung open, and into the courtyard wheeled a cavalcade of young monks, lamas, and the chief astrologer. He was an old man, wizened, small, some eighty years of age. Close behind him, almost leg to leg, in fact, rode two lamas whose sole duty it was to make sure that the aged man did not topple off and get trampled underfoot. The horses came to a stop, knowing full well that the end of the journey had come and now they would be well fed. The two lama attendants jumped off their horses and carefully lifted the old astrologer. Then, the Lord Rampa came forward, and there was the customary exchange of scarves, the customary bowing, and bowing in return. Then the chief astrologer and Lord Rampa entered the reception room where all the assembled people bowed. For a few moments there was a certain amount of confusion and turmoil. Then the chief astrologer, having politely tasted the proffered buttered tea, motioned to two lamas who carried the notes and charts. The deep-toned gong sounded again. Boom! 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 The far end of the reception room was flung open, and the chief astrologer and his two lama attendants walked forward through the door out into the garden to where a great marquee, specially imported from India, had been erected. One side of the marquee was open so that the maximum number of people should be able to see and hear what was going on. Inside the marquee, the dais had been erected with rails on three sides, and near the front were four seats. 
the chief astrologer and his two lama attendants approached the dais, and then four servants appeared carrying upright poles, or flambeaux, because at the distal end there were large flares showing that these men were recognizing that here in this marquee there were the flames of knowledge. Four trumpeters appeared next. They sounded a fanfare. They were to draw attention to Lord and Lady Rampa, because their son, the heir to the Lalu estate, was the cause of all the commotion, as one onlooker said. The Lord and Lady slowly mounted the dais and stood behind the four chairs. From another direction, and with their own retinue, there came two very, very old men from the lamasary of the State Oracle. These two old men from the lamasary of Nechang were, after the chief astrologer, the most experienced astrologers in the country. They were collaborators with the chief astrologer. They had gone over the figures and charts and computations, and each of the sheets of the horoscope contained the seals of the approval of each of these men. The chief astrologer stood. The others sat. Suddenly there fell a hush upon the assembled company. The chief astrologer gazed out at the throng and built up suspense by remaining quite silent for some moments. Then, at a gesture, the two lamas moved forward, one to each side of him. The one on the right held the assembled book of the horoscope. The one on the left carefully removed the top wooden plaque, and the chief astrologer read his remarks. People had to strain because, with age, the astrologer had a thin, high voice, which to those in the background blended with the birds who chirped in the topmost branches. His opening remarks were the ritual remarks on such occasions. Gods, devils, and men all behave in the same way, he said. So the future can be foretold, but the future is not immutable. The future can, within certain limits, be changed. Thus it is, we can forecast only the probabilities, and having forecast the probabilities, predict the good and the bad, then indeed we must leave the rest to those whose horoscopes we are reading. He stopped and looked about him, and the lama on the left removed the top sheet, leaving the second one exposed. The astrologer took a deep breath and continued. Here we have the most remarkable horoscope that the three of us have ever computed. He turned and bowed slightly to his two collaborators. Then clearing his throat, he continued. This is the horoscope of a young boy just six years of age. It is the most difficult horoscope and the hardest life which we have encountered. Lord and Lady Rampa shifted uneasily. Certainly this wasn't turning out as they expected. They weren't at all happy. But with the training of their caste, they maintained an inscrutable expression. Behind them, the cause of all the trouble, the heir to the estate, Lab Sang Rampa felt gloomy indeed. All oh, this waste of time! How many people would have been crossing the river? What was the boatman doing? Were the cats all right? He felt he had to stand there like a stuffed dummy, while three ancient, almost fossilized men decided what he would have to do with his life. Surely, he thought, 
he should have some say in what he was going to do. People had been telling him how wonderful it was to be the heir to such an immense estate, saying what a credit he would be to his parents. Well, he thought he wanted to be a fairy man. He wanted to look after cats somewhere. Certainly he didn't want to work. But the astrologer was droning on, and there was a complete silence from the audience. They were indeed enthralled. This boy must go to the medical lamissary at Shakpuri. He must do his penance and his homage before he can be permitted to enter. And, having entered, he must start as the lowest of the low and work his way up. He must learn all the medical arts of Tibet. He must for a time do that which is almost unmentionable. He must work with the disposers of the dead that in cutting up the bodies he may understand the structure of the human body. Having done this, he will return to Shakpuri and study yet again he will be shown the innermost mysteries of our land, of our belief, and of our science. The old man held out his hand, and an attendant quickly gave him a small silver beaker containing some liquid, which he looked at and then swallowed. The attendant carefully took back the silver beaker and refilled it, ready for the next demand. The astrologer went on. Then shall come the time when no longer may he remain in this land of ours. Instead, he must journey to China to study medicine according to the Western style, for there is a Western school of medicine in Chungking. At that school of medicine, he shall take a fresh name for let it not be known that the heir to Lalu shall be dealing with the bodies. Later, he shall learn something which is quite incomprehensible to us at present. It is something which has not yet come about, something which is not yet properly invented. To our experienced brains, it seems that he may do something which entails flying through the air, yet which is not the levitation which some of us can do here in Lhasa. So upon this particular aspect, I must be obscure, because indeed it is most obscure to the three of us. The boy who then will be a young man will have to work this out for himself. He will fly through the air by some means. Our picture shows something like the kites with which we are familiar, but this particular kite is not tethered to the ground by rope. Instead, it appears to be controlled by those who ride on it. There was much muttering and urgent whispering from the congregation. This was wonders piled on wonders. Never before had such things been spoken of. For a moment there was the uneasy shuffling of feet, and then the astrologer took another drink and turned back to the, by now, diminishing sheets of paper. He shall have immense suffering, immense hardship, he shall enter a war against evil forces. He shall, for some years, be confined and undergo suffering such as few have undergone, the purpose of which will be to purify and to drive away the dross of any sensuality, and to build the power of the brain to endure. Later. He shall get away from his captors after some immense explosion which throws a whole country or a whole world, maybe, into confusion. 
he shall travel by means which we cannot identify across a vast continent and at the end of that travel he shall again be incarcerated unjustly suffering will come upon him there with at least as great measure as it did in the other confinement at last by the intervention of unknown people he shall be released and forced out of that great continent he shall wander into many countries meeting many people seeing many cultures learning many things and then at last he shall go to a country where once again he shall not be welcomed because of his difference the suffering will have changed him enormously so that he no longer seems of our own kind but different and when humans meet anything which is different they fear that thing and that which they fear they hate and try to destroy the old man was looking tired at last the senior attendant stepped forward muttered to the astrologer and then said we shall have a few minutes rest while our chief astrologer recuperates for the second half of this reading let us then for the moment concentrate upon that which has been said so that we may the more easily assimilate that which is to follow the chief astrologer sat down refreshments were brought to him and he watched the throngs of people and as he sat watching the throngs of people he thought of his own boyhood he thought of the times he had climbed the high mountains in the deepest of nights so he could gaze upon the stars arrayed in the heavens above he had pondered long upon the significance of those stars did they have influence on people he decided to find out by various means and probably because he was fated to do so he entered the lamissary of the state oracle and he was found to have quite abnormal ability at astrology an astrology of course which is far superior to that of the western world far more complete and far far more accurate it includes more variables and could be projected at greater depth the young man who was destined to be the chief astrologer of the whole of tibet progressed rapidly studying 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 he obtained the ancient texts of india the texts of china and almost rewrote the science of astrology in tibet as his skill rose his fame increased so that he was called upon by the heads of all the great houses of lhasa and then of other cities of tibet soon he was called upon to do predictions for the government and for the great thirteenth himself always he was strictly honest if he did not know he said he did not know he had predicted the British invasion. He had predicted the departure of the great thirteenth to another country and his safe return. And he had made the prediction that there would be no real Dalai Lama after the thirteenth had gone to the state of transition. There would be another, but he would have been selected as a matter of political expediency in an attempt to assuage the territorial ambitions of the Chinese. He had made the prediction that in sixty years or so there would be the end of Tibet as it was then known. A completely fresh order would come into force which would cause extreme hardship and suffering but might, if it were handled correctly, have the effect of sweeping away an outmoded system and bringing after a hundred years or so benefits to tibet 
The chief astrologer sipped his buttered tea and looked at the people before him. He watched the way some of the young men looked at the young women, and the way in which the young women glanced back, coyly, invitingly. He thought of his long years as a celibate monk, nearly eighty years, he thought, and he hardly knew in which way a woman differed from a man. His knowledge was of the stars, of the influence of the stars, and of men and women as they were affected by the stars. He looked at calmly young women and wondered if it really was right for monks to be celibate. Surely, he thought, mankind should consist of two parts, the male and the female principle and unless the two parts are united there cannot be a complete man. He thought of all the tales he had heard of how women were becoming more and more arrogant, more trying to rule. He looked about at some of the older women with their harsh faces, and he noted their domineering attitude. And then he thought, well, perhaps it is that the time is not yet ripe for man and woman to be united to form one whole, to form one complete entity. But that will come, although not until the end of this round of existence. So thinking, he gave up his cup to an attendant and signaled that he was ready to continue. A hush again fell upon the assembly. People were looking up towards the dais. As the old man was assisted to his feet, the books were again placed before him. He looked around once more and said, Some of the experiences which will befall the subject of this reading are so far beyond our own experience that they cannot be predicted in a sufficiently accurate form to be worth while. It is known definitely that this person has a great, great task to do. It is a task which is of the utmost importance to the whole of humanity, not of Tibet alone. It is known that there are evil forces, very evil forces indeed, who are working hard to negate that which he must do. He will encounter hatred. He will encounter every form of hardship and suffering. And he will know what it is to be at the point of death and have to undergo the ordeal of transmigration into another body so that the work may go forward. But here, in this other body, fresh problems will arise. He will be disowned by his own people because of that political expediency which I have already mentioned. It will be considered to the benefit of a people as a whole that he be disowned, that he be not supported by those who should support him, by those who could support him, and I say again, that these are probabilities, because it is quite possible for our own people to support him and give him an opportunity to speak before the nations of the world, so that, first, Tibet may be saved, and secondly, that great task, whose exact nature may not be mentioned, may be more speedily accomplished. But weak people, in temporary abridged authority, shall not be strong enough to assist him, and so he shall battle alone against the forces of evil and against the uncaring people who he is trying to help. The old man looked around and motioned to the left-handed attendant to remove the next sheet. The attendant blushed little at having to be reminded, and speedily did as he was bade. The astrologer went on. There is a special association or group 
which gives information to peoples of the world beyond our confines. They are of an insufficient spiritual stature to understand the task which has to be accomplished, and their sensational hatred shall make the task immeasurably more difficult. As well as this, there is a small group of people who will be filled with burning hatred and will do everything possible to ruin the subject of this horoscope and cause him every distress. The old man paused and put his hand on the topmost sheet as a signal that he'd finished with the books. Then he turned and addressed the congregation. With the years of my experience I say to you this, no matter how great the struggle, no matter how severe the suffering, the task is worthwhile. The only battle that matters is the final battle. It does not matter who wins or who loses, the wars that continue until the final battle, and in the end, the final battle shall be won by the powers of good, and that which has to be done shall be done. He bowed three times to the people, and then turned and bowed three times to the Lord and Lady Rampa, and then he sat down to rest his legs, which were shaking with the weight of the years. The audience, whispering among themselves, quickly dispersed and went into the gardens in search of entertainment, and there was much entertainment offered. Music, acrobats, jugglers, and of course food and drink. After the astrologer and his two collaborators had rested a while, they rose and went into the great house, where they had more to say to the parents of Lobsang Rampa. They had more to say to Lobsang as well, to say privately, alone with him. Soon the chief astrologer departed on his way back to the Patala and his two collaborators departed on their journey to the lamasery of the state oracle. The day wore on. There came the dusk, and at the warning of dusk the assembled people wended their way out at the great gate and along the road so they may reach their homes before night, and the perils thereof came upon them. The darkness fell, and out in the road beyond the great gate, a lonely little boy stood, looking down the road at the last of the departing guests and the carousing which they were making. He stood, with hands clasped, thinking of a life of misery which had been predicted, thinking of the horrors of war which he did not understand thinking of the insensate persecution yet to come. He stood there alone, alone in all the world, and no one had such a problem. He stood there, and the night grew darker, and no one came to seek him and to lead him back. At last, as the moon was full above, he lay down by the side of the road. The gate was shut anyhow, and in minutes there came a purring beside his head, and a great big cat lay down beside him. The boy put his arm around the cat. The cat purred louder. Soon the boy drifted off to a troubled sleep, but the cat was alert, watching, guarding. So ends the first book the book of As It Was in the Beginning.